Healthy mitochondria are really sort of like the ultimate tumor suppressor. And one way to ensure that your mitochondria are robust and healthy is to rely uh, more on fat metabolism and ketone metabolism and not so much on sugar, inefficient sugar metabolism. Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body, Mind, Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seem Lund, and our guest today is Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. Dr. Dom has a PhD in neuroscience and physiology. He's a professor at the University of Florida, and is considered one of the world's top experts in ketosis, ketogenic diets, fasting, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy. This episode is brought to you by BioOptimizer's Magnesium Breakthrough. Almost every person is deficient in magnesium because it's being depleted by stress. And on top of that, our foods are also much lower in magnesium because of soil depletion. BioOptimizer's has an amazing full-spectrum magnesium supplement called Magnesium Breakthrough. It includes seven of the most important magnesium types. Check out Magnesium Breakthrough at magbreakthrough.com forward slash seam and use the code seam10 for a 10% discount. Thank you for having me, Seam. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, really glad to talk with you. And uh, like you were one of my first, let's say, these experts that I started following in terms of ketosis and the ketogenic diet. So yeah, I'm really ex- excited to talk with you. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, and you are like uh, m- m- many people would consider you like the world's leading expert on ketosis and uh, keto. So how did you get into it and what got you like interested? Yeah, uh, well, I was trained in neuroscience and like, I guess what I would call like fundamental uh, basic science research. And I did uh, patch clamp electrophysiology where I measure electrical recordings in the brain uh, over time. And I did that for my PhD research, which then led to research on seizures and with a particular focus on military applications uh, associated with the special operations community, the Navy SEALs. They use a closed circuit rebreather when they do their dive operations and a limitation of their dive uh, safety and performance would be oxygen toxicity seizures. So I was mostly focused on looking for a drug and looking for different antioxidant cocktails that could prevent the reactive oxygen species that would be elevated in the brain that was thought to be contributing to these seizures. But when we studied cellular preparations and also brain size preparations, it became apparent to me that it was a dysregulation of metabolic homeostasis that was contributing to uh, excess electrical excitability, in particular, an excess release of glutamate, which would cause hyperexcitability and then a seizure. Hmm. But it was really the maintenance of the energy status, the ATP that was failing. So uh, I started looking into things like lactate and even creatine and other metabolites, but uh, ketones got put onto my radar. and, And then I discovered, although I trained in nutrition science as an undergrad, I didn't really appreciate the anti seizure neuroprotective effects of the ketogenic diet. So I guess around 2007 or 8, uh, I became interested in using the ketogenic diet uh, for this application of research, which was oxygen toxicity seizures. And, and then it all started from there. So I actually was really amazed at how much you know, basic science research and clinical research there was on a ketogenic diet for a, uh, a clinical, it was basically you know, a certified clinical uh, therapy for drug-resistant epilepsy and other drug-resistant seizures. So it kind of fit perfectly with what I was proposing, which was to put a warfighter into a ketogenic state to make them more resilient against the extreme environment of high oxygen toxicity. And in addition to protecting their brain, I became also interested in the performance applications of the ketogenic diet and ultimately exogenous ketone uh, supplementation, which we have a pretty active, very active research program on. Hmm. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting that uh, you kind of 
uh, stumbled upon almost uh, on this very simple and very like um, intrinsic part of the human metabolism such as ketosis like it's uh we've evolved to be in ketosis like a lot of the time and it's also like very natural for us to go into whenever we are like fasting or whenever like restricting carbohydrates so it's like a very powerful state and it's like very simplistic and uh, seems to be very effective for like this very uh, related issues that you talked about like uh, oxygen toxicity and just general like high stress uh, neuronal stress yeah, yeah. And so our research on seizures has really expanded into many different applications to, uh, you know, metabolic management of cancer and cancer cachexia, which is muscle wasting. Uh, we have a study on Angelman syndrome. We did a mouse study. Now there's a human clinical trial. Uh, we're looking at glycemic regulation, so lowering blood glucose, uh, wound healing. Uh, Kabuki syndrome, which is a rare genetic disorder. We're looking at ketosis for that. So we have a lot of different applications right now uh, that we're applying therapeutic ketosis to. And that could be in the form of uh, restricted, time-restricted eating. It could be in the form of uh, macronutrient ratios associated with low-carb or ketogenic diets and a wide range of ketone supplements, which could be a salt, uh, ketone salt, or ketone ester or medium chain triglycerides or combinations of them. And we think that different formulations may work uh, suitably for different applications, whether it be performance uh, or seizure control or Alzheimer's disease or, or what have you. So there's different, we have to vet out and understand what formulas work best for different applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, initially the ketogenic diet was used to uh, treat epilepsy. And uh, how how prevalent is it uh, nowadays uh, in 2020? How uh, how like uh, doctors do do they use it, uh, or are they still somewhat like using different kinds of medication or skeptical about it? Yeah, a good question. Uh, well, I, I'm. I've been a chair of the American Epilepsy Society special interest group for, I guess, going on to the third year now. Hopefully they'll have the meeting. It's in December uh, this year. But uh, and that that's a mainstream epilepsy kind of uh, conference with thousands of people. And it's fairly well attended. And they are. Uh, it's good that popular public interest in the ketogenic diet has stimulated the neurologists and epileptologists to revisit the ketogenic diet uh, as a therapy, but it's still not the frontline therapy. So it's only used after uh, multiple anti-epileptic drugs fail. And that's simply, that's due to a number of reasons. Probably the most uh, important reason is that it's difficult for a neurologist to uh, to really get patients to comply or parents to comply with implementing the ketogenic diet. So some patients are unwilling or unable to make the lifestyle change associated with following uh, a ketogenic diet, and that has been the limitation. But for severe epilepsy, uh, there are many different clinics, about at least 150 different clinics in the United States that are treating uh, pediatric epilepsy and now adult epilepsy, adults for about 12 years now uh, with, the, with the ketogenic diet. So mm -hmm. it's becoming more popular. Uh, it's not the frontline therapy, but I think what's, what has made it more popular is that we understand it does not have to be as restrictive as we once thought that the protein can be more liberal, especially in adults, and they don't have to restrict protein to like 10%. They could do 20 and even 30% uh, protein. So that has actually made it fairly feasible uh, uh, from a quality of life perspective and an implementation perspective. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think the future is to develop food products that can incorporate ketogenic supplementation that can further augment the therapeutic efficacy of the ketogenic diet. And maybe in some places, ketone supplementation can replace the ketogenic diet in patients that are unable or unwilling to implement it. And there are some patients with certain disorders that make the ketogenic diet difficult to implement. Mm. 
Yeah, so there are like, uh, let's say, degrees of adherence. So on the on the one end, you have fasting, like strict fasting, where you experience these anti seizure effects. Then you have the ketogenic diet. Then you have the somewhat of a like a liberal ketogenic diet that you mentioned with higher protein. And uh, then you have the supplements. So it's like on one end you have like very hard extreme fasting, and on the other hand you can mimic a lot of the effects of the fasting with the supplements and uh, eating this ketogenic diet. Yeah, yeah, so that's right. I think, you know, for some people, it will depend upon personalizing what approaches. There are some, uh, not kids, probably are not a good candidate for time-restricted eating, for intermittent fasting. The, the parents are very, uh, you know, that, that's a scary thing to do for a parent right. to, like, restrict uh, food. But for uh, adult patients, uh, many of them prefer time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. And then the parents are very uh, enthusiastic and really want to see more research to validate ketone supplementation because they see this as sort of the next frontier uh, in, in really helping their children. And if this supplement can elevate you know, ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, and these have been shown to have anti-seizure neuroprotective effects. And then they can titrate and adjust the dosage to hit therapeutic levels in the blood. That's very appealing to them. And we're kind of working a lot on that front. Mm. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, the beta hydroxybutyrate. So what is, what is making those ketones uh, have this anti-seizure effect? Like why, why are they beneficial for the brain and uh, especially like this ne neuronal stress? Uh, yeah, it, that's the question that we're really interested in, in understanding. And we don't know all the reasons why. But our research to date has demonstrated that you need to elevate beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. So they are typically in the blood as a, maybe a three to one or a four to one ratio. Beta hydroxybutyrate is the reduced form of the ketone body and is more stable in circulation where acetoacetate uh, can spontaneously decarboxylate to acetone. And we blow off acetone in our breath and it gives our breath a, a fruity sort of smell if we're in a strong state of ketosis. Interestingly, acetone is not really a good metabolic fuel, but it has signaling effects. It has anti-seizure effects. So this has been shown in a wide variety of animal models. And breath acetone levels actually correlate well with seizure control. And I use a device that's a breath acetone meter by Readout Health. Uh, it's called Biosense. And that breath acetone meter uh, they've done a sufficient amount of studies to determine, uh, to correlate breath acetone with blood beta hydroxybutyrate. And to my knowledge, the readout health unit uh, does it pretty remarkably well. And there's a study on that to, to demonstrate that uh, under different conditions. And when you're fasting, I find it to be remarkably uh, useful for quantifying the level of ketosis in a fasting state, the breath acetone. Um, so, you know, when, in regards to seizures, beta hydroxybutyrate, uh, is a very effective metabolic substrate that can help perhaps preserve energy production, uh, even in a brain that has an impaired metabolic machinery, for example, glucose transporter type one deficiency syndrome, uh, is a, is a, is a syndrome where there's a deficiency of the glut one transporter. And in the case of beta hydroxybutyrate specifically, it can help restore and preserve uh, brain energy metabolism. So we think it's, it's working in that way. The standard of care for GLUT1 deficiency is the ketogenic diet. So it's really like it is medically the standard of care. Pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency syndrome, again, the standard of care is the ketogenic diet. So it bypasses PDH complex to, uh, to enter the Krebs cycle to produce the reduced intermediates to drive the electron transport chain. So in, and in doing so, this helps to preserve brain energy metabolism, even in the face of a limiting or deficient uh, uh, enzymatic system that's really the rate limiting system for energy production in the brain, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So, uh, so it, it works remarkably well for that. Uh, acetoacetate, on the other hand, um, it, it has 
we think it has like direct anti-seizure effects, perhaps through uh, acetone. And acetone can affect different ion channels, we think, and, and membrane hyperexcitability to reduce hyperexcitability to make the resting membrane more hyperpolarized. When neurons are more hyperpolarized, they fire less action potentials. Uh, so, you know, and, and there's also the, uh, the redox effect on the cells. Beta hydroxybutyrate may be decreasing oxygen free radicals, uh, it may be reducing neuroinflammation. So, different seizure disorders can be triggered by inflammatory states. So, the state of ketosis can reduce systemic inflammation, which will also reduce neuroinflammation. And the brain is much more uh, likely to be in a hyper excitable seizure like state if there's inflammation. And new data is emerging to indicate that ketone bodies have an, infl an anti inflammatory effect, not only systemically, but maybe in the brain too. Uh, so, there, these are many of the things that are under investigation. Uh, and there's not really a general consensus uh, on what the mechanism is. But there is a general consensus that therapeutic ketosis achieved with a ketogenic diet or fasting, and more recently supplemental ketosis, has a profound anti-seizure neuroprotective effect that in many cases works better than anti-seizure drugs or even combinations of anti-seizure drugs. Hmm. So this to me is what excited me about getting into this research, is that we could use food and an altered metabolic physiology to treat something very specific, you know, a neurological disease that's very specific. So I, it, I became very excited to use nutrition as medicine and also, more importantly, understand fundamentally why this is working the way it is. Mm, well, yeah, <laughs> that's a really good explanation. And yeah, it's a great overview that essentially your, your brain and body become somewhat more like resistant to stress and also more energy efficient in a way that you don't experience uh, like energy deprivation. And therefore, you're also able to stay, maintain like the stable uh, homeostasis and inner balance more easily. Yeah, I think the real, um, you know, where the ketogenic diet has the most application is when there is a disorder or a deficiency or a defect. And the state of nutritional ketosis tends to bring the body and the brain back to homeostasis. And I think because it's doing that in a disease state, the question is, you know, for the general audience, you know, should we be using it in normal, healthy patients? <laughs> and, and even for, we know it's very effective for controlling hyperglycemia and glycemic variability. So, should patients who are otherwise healthy, uh, should they go on a low carb ketogenic diet? Would there be benefits to prevent uh, being pre diabetic or di you know, type 2 diabetes later on in life? So, this is a question I think I'm very passionate about and very interested in. I actually, even use a continuous glucose monitor to, uh, to understand glycemic variability in response to my diet, to stress, to exercise. And I think the, the information that we can get from that and from the whole community of people who are using continuous glucose monitoring systems, uh, because there's not a whole lot of data on even type 2 diabetes and normal people with continuous glucose monitors, but that information really should be collected and could be applied to various disease models. And the way I think about it is like insurance companies can pay now to, to give this technology to patients maybe who are susceptible to diabetes or they can pay later and they'll pay a lot more later. Yeah. So I think, I think there's emerging technologies that can really be helpful. And what I've you know, experienced and I think what the data will show is that low carbohydrate ketogenic diets are the most powerful uh, regulators of glycemic variability, uh, it's the most powerful tool that we have. So it beats any drug that's out there. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think in people that are, are willing to do this, uh, I think insurance companies should find a way to help them do it by supporting companies that develop ketogenic food products, pre, 
pre-planned ketogenic whole food meals, ketone supplements, things like that. From my perspective, I think right now we have a great opportunity as technology is emerging to apply uh, things like continuous glucose monitoring systems, breath acetone systems, as a means to quantify this unique metabolic state, nutritional ketosis, and to apply that to a wide range of disease processes, some of the most probably relevant and important ones would be things like diabetes, type, type 2 diabetes, for example. And uh, it's, it's remarkable how effective carbohydrate restriction can be for decreasing glycemic variability. And I did not really have a full appreciation of this until I actually used a continuous glucose monitoring device. And I have to say from, um, you know, I don't have problems, you know, regulating my glucose levels. I'm not type 2 diabetic, but it was very motivating to see it was almost an audit on my, my food intake and my meal selection by being able to see the metabolic consequences of the food I was eating. And and eating specific foods at certain times, for example, lots of sugar and carbs late at night, mm -hmm. results in a high glucose level in the morning and a mm -hmm. dysregulation of sleep. So yeah. being able to monitor these things and not, not, they don't have to be worn all the time. I think if we wear them for 14 to 28 days, that gives us enough information mm -hmm. to give us actionable uh, things to do to improve yeah. our metabolic health. Yeah, like uh, it's the the saying that um, prevention is the best medicine. And uh, if you take care of your health proactively, then you're not going to get sick that easily, or uh, you're going to postpone it as much as possible. And uh, therefore, yeah, you'll you'll you know save a lot of money and save a lot of your time for being healthy. And yeah, I've I will, I've also used the uh, continuous glucose monitoring. And uh, when you are like restricting carbs, then it's very like stable all throughout the entire day because you're not eating carbs and you're, you're like not spiking your blood sugar all the time. So it's, uh, yeah, you do feel like the stable level of energy and stable cognition and uh, no like these swings in your energy levels throughout the entire day. Yeah, and that was a big motivating factor for me to uh, continue to follow a ketogenic diet as part of my research. Uh, but in the beginning, 10 years ago, people, especially in the neurology community, thought it was a bit strange that I was following this diet that's used for epilepsy. And, uh, and I had to admit that I felt that I had more sustained energy over time and less fluctuations in energy and was able to be more productive from an, from an academic standpoint. And I think it really helped me a lot. Uh, it helped me to focus a lot too, and, and just to be more productive in general. Uh, not having to stop to eat because I was hungry. Uh, I used to eat a lot of fish and rice, a lot of rice, and uh, prior to doing the ketogenic diet, and I remember always getting hungry about two or three hours later, and I'd have to stop everything, mm -hmm. even when my flow of thoughts were good. And now hunger is really not an issue, and I can power through things and get a string of six to eight hours of, of work done. And, and not having to interrupt my work by cooking and eating and cleaning up has really made me productive in the lab and in the office too. Yeah, totally. Like the, it gives you like a lot of freedom, and uh, it's yeah. Like once you get once you get used to it, then it's uh, like you. Most people don't really want to go back to it, uh, or at least they'll they'll stay somewhat keto for like a long term. And w one thing that I've also noticed is that uh, your let's say your uh, your threshold for hypoglycemia also gets uh, much higher so to say so that your blood sugar can go much lower uh, compared to normal people and you won't experience symptoms of hypoglycemia because your brain and your body it doesn't need that glucose and it can run on ketones so therefore your blood sugar can drop a lot lower without experiencing like all the negative side effects like you know brain fog and uh, passing out and lethargy yeah that's a really good point and i think over time your brain adapts remarkably well to uh, functioning in what mainstream clinical medicine would say is hypoglycemia. Yeah. So I had some of the most productive uh, writing marathons uh, with my glucose in the 60s to 50s range mm -hmm. continuously when I was fasting. I got yeah. a tremendous amount of work done, like grants written and publications, uh, probably more productive than I had been you know, uh, ever. 
So, and I did that in a state where my glucose was fluctuating about 62 plus or minus like five millimolar, you know, or, uh, or milligrams per deciliter. So in millimolar, that would be about three or under three millimolar. Uh, and I, you know, maintaining that continuously for days uh, while working and basically just having a small cup of coffee in the morning and then just some, uh, just drinking water and maybe some electrolytes throughout the fasting. Mm. Yeah. Is there like a, uh, is there like a danger to having too high ketones or going too low with your blood sugar, like entering into ketoacidosis? Uh, in the context of, unless you're type one diabetic, where you don't make a sufficient amount of insulin and insulin helps regulate your endogenous ketone production, uh, that could be problematic. But even low carbohydrate diets and ketogenic diets can also be remarkably effective for uh, type one diabetics to manage their glucose levels. So when my former PhD student, uh, now Dr. Andrew Kutnick, uh, is a good example of that. He even gave a TEDx talk uh, describing the use of a, a ketogenic or a low carbohydrate strategy for managing his type one diabetes and a very active in the, in the type one diabetes community and diabetes, general diabetes community, uh, as an advocate for low carbohydrate. Uh, so, so I think that there could be potential dangers when it comes to using more powerful agents like ketone esters, because they have the ability to elevate your ketones to any level and we have seen we have observed in animal models that they can be toxic if the levels get really high but this may not even be realistic for humans because i'm not sure they could tolerate from a gastrointestinal standpoint you know a dose of ketone salts uh but they i think you could probably overdose someone with ketone esters especially if you made them taste good so uh but the ketone esters are most powerful are the ones that have the worst taste. So, uh, <laughs> so in that way, although I know technology will be able to mask the taste of it, these are very powerful agents that are extremely dense forms of energy. And if they are consumed in excess, they could overwhelm the body's capacity to buffer the ketones in the blood. And that, that could, you could achieve a ketoacidosis state that could be potentially, you know, uh, cause some health complications and even death. Mm. Uh, so that's why I think like ketone esters need to go through regulatory channels, the FDA, and their highest potential are for uh, clinical, treating clinical disorders like status epilepticus or seizure disorders that are very resistant. Uh, on the other hand, they have really important military applications for warfighter performance and application you know in that context too and that's really where i work uh so we are working to make them as safe as possible and to make them most efficacious as possible mm. and choosing you know we work with a variety of different agents and trying to choose the the ketogenic strategy that's going to be most you know efficacious for our application mm. yeah yeah like uh i would yeah like the body doesn't do well if it's given like an abundance of energy in too much like if you if you drink let's say uh this gatorade that has uh, i don't know 100 grams of carbs then that's also like really bad and you know your body will experience negative side effects from it and the same can but can apply to the keto ketones and uh but i wanted to talk a little bit about the aspect of oxygen uh, uh, you mentioned that you know ketones are useful in uh, oxygen toxicity, but what about uh, oxygen deprivation, like when you are in low oxygen environments? Yeah, well, uh, there's groups that you know I'm involved with. Uh, I think some of the more active research is being done at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, where or IHMC. Uh, the director is Ken Ford there. And uh, they have a number of, of projects currently uh, in progress, even, you know, maybe stalled a little bit because of COVID-19. But their objective is to understand the performance uh, and the cognitive and physical performance consequences of uh, high levels of oxygen and using a ketone ester or a ketogenic strategy to preserve uh, resilience in, in hypoxic environments. 
And there's animal model work showing that there's potential advantage. And there's anecdotal studies in climbers, uh, in other people that do breath hold diving. I know that I was able to significantly extend my breath hold time. Uh, I'm a pretty, uh, not, not recently in the last few months because of the lockdown, but uh, we like to do a lot of diving and my wife is certified for free diving, uh, but we do a lot of uh, snorkeling and diving and things like that. And so I'm pretty aware of what my breath hold time was. And uh, I'm aware that I can significantly extend that if I elevate my ketones. And uh, although the best method for extending my breath hold time uh, for hypoxia is with fasting. Mm. So when I fasted for a week, I mean, there was like a, almost a 50% increase wow. in my breath hold time. And I think that had to do not only because of the ketones, but because when you're fasting for that long, it decreases your sympathetic nervous system. Uh, I think it enhances metabolic efficiency in the brain and in the body. And it was remarkable because I was so in tune and so aware of what my breath hold time was that when I did that, it was an afterthought. I was like, okay, I fasted for a week now. I'm doing all these experiments. Let me go check my breath hold time. And it was remarkably. Uh, uh, improved. And I think that has very significant practical implications too for people who are, you know, <laughs> free diving. So free, the free diving, come to find out the free diving community already knew this. Mm. Maybe they don't make it public, but even people like David Blaine, who like held their breath for very long points of time, like incorporate, you know, fasting and things to extend their breath all time. But, and I think it has to do with metabolic changes in fasting and also due in part to the elevation of ketone bodies, which enhance metabolic efficiency under uh, a deprivation of oxygen. Hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, I, I don't have like a lot of experience with this myself, but I've also seen uh, this one study. I don't recall what the particular condition was, like, but I think that some patients... Uh, who had uh, pneumonia, uh, one, one of the groups who were in ketosis or put on a keto diet, they were, they were able to you know, spend significantly less time uh, uh, with ventilation. So they were basically recovering faster thanks to being in ketosis. So I may miss some of the details, but yeah, like I think yeah, the ketosis kind of essentially help you to improve like your oxygen efficiency a little bit. Yeah, it does. Uh, that, that's true. I think I know the, the study you're talking about. You also get, yeah, you have more oxygen efficiency and more of a complete, I would say, com complete combustion of carbon source substrates. Mm. So the consequence to that would be a reduction in your respiratory quotient, uh, more towards like 0.7, which is completely fat. So another consequence is less CO2 production. So mm. there's less carbon dioxide being produced for the amount of oxygen that's consumed uh so that's that's part of it too and i think a decrease in co2 burden is uh could be a, a very beneficial thing uh for the body especially in the context of things that i study like you know closed circuit rebreathers or submarines or uh underwater habitats or even space situation if you're on a space station or a space capsule mm -hmm. and you are producing significantly less carbon dioxide uh, that's an advantage and it's a concept. It's an advantage logistically, but it's also uh, a physiological advantage uh, for the metabolism that's happening in the person. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So does the, uh, does the less CO2 come from the fact that uh, you produce less CO2 when you metabolize fat and you produce more when you, uh, when you burn carbs? Yeah, there's a shift in uh, O2 consumption and CO2 production that uh, you can quantify that with the respiratory quotient. So, uh, yeah, you have proportionally less CO2 being produced for a net amount of energy that's being burned. And uh, if you metabolize energy through oxidative phosphorylation, uh, is specifically uh, fats and ketones, you uh, you are essentially, you know, using oxygen more efficiently and less and producing less uh, CO2 in the process. Mm -hmm. And some may argue greater ATP is generated 
in response to the substrate being burned. With glucose uh, consumption, I think the body in general will rely on oxidative phosphorylation, you know, up to 80 percent, 80 to 85 percent. And as we become more diseased, there's likely a shift towards more glycolytic uh, energy production if you damage respiration and mitochondrial efficiency. And that gradual shift towards glycolytic activity also creates a mild acidosis in the cell systems. And the, the nucleus of the cell may be able to sense uh, an energetic crisis uh, through retrograde sort of response in the cell itself. So the nucleus can sense that the mitochondria is not sort of doing its job. So the mitochondria are kind of unique in that they act as though they kind of, they're not sure they want to be with us or not. <laughs> you know, they have their own DNA and they're like their own separate entities. So it's like, you know, if you study them, they're very unique organelles. And I think like the original Greek term for organelle was like little tools or something like that. So they're like little tools or little independent organisms like in the cell. And they're not, comp they're, they're like so independent, they can almost function uh, by their own. And you can isolate mitochondria uh, in a mitochondrial suspension and they continue to respire independent of the cell. But they do release factors and the nucleus can sense that the mitochondria are under stress and that can actually trigger uh, the nuclear genome. Uh, the fidelity of the nuclear genome can be compromised if there's a decrease in ATP, the energy currency. And there's robust DNA repair processes that can be compromised and that can cause um, uh, oncogenes to be activated. And that's the initial step of transforming a normal cell into a cancer cell. And it's highly dependent upon the energy status of the cell and the cell being able to uh, sense this energetic crisis. And that could be a consequence of a carcinogenic agents, an infection, uh, radiation, hypoxia, all these things. We call that the oncogenic paradox. Uh, and all these things cause mitochondrial stress, which is sensed by the nucleus, which is a trigger for carcinogenesis or tumorigenesis. So the, the point of all this is that healthy mitochondria are really sort of like the ultimate tumor suppressor. And one way to ensure that your mitochondria are robust and healthy is to rely uh, more on fat metabolism and ketone metabolism and not so much on sugar, inefficient sugar metabolism. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, the obvious ways to do that are, with diet, with exercise, with fasting, and with choosing the substrates that you allow your body to burn. Yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, it's like, you know, humans are meant to burn fat most of the time at lower intensities. Uh, right. And we use glycogen and carbs only for like sprinting or doing something uh, heavy intensity. Uh, but the problem is that if people are eating like this crappy standard American diet with a lot of carbs and uh, processed foods and eating all the time, then they lose this Keto, ad keto adaptation, so to say, they lose the ability to burn fat and they start burning carbs almost all the time. And uh, that's where their mitochondria uh, become wrecked and that's where they develop insulin resistance and car carcinogenesis and uh, they become sick from the inside out. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's important to recognize too, I mean, kind of as you described there, it's a general process too, right? It's like, uh, this is something that happens like over time and doesn't necessarily occur tomorrow <laughs> you know it's it's uh and i think it, it's also a it's also a more uh protracted process like when you shift your diet there are days to weeks to months to even years of adaptation and the more you adapt your body to being a fat metabolizer a ketone producer and utilizer uh the easier it, it is to enter that state and to come in and out of that state. And, and also the more benefits you derive from it over time when you maintain that state. I think the net accumulation of reactive oxygen species when you're in that state uh, is less and you'll accumulate probably less uh, damage to lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids over time because there's going to be less reactive oxygen species, less oxidative stress, 
and you're doing things like upregulating endogenous antioxidant systems, glutathione, uh, superoxide dismutase, catalase, all these things uh, from the mitochondria perspective too, and also in the cytosol. And, uh, and that's probably why people who are keto adapted and they, they experience an intense bout of exercise, they're less sore. And that reduction in chronic inflammation is facilitating adaptive changes associated with skeletal muscle remodeling and skeletal muscle protein synthesis to allow them to adapt and repair muscle so they're, they can more quickly you know, be in a state where a subsequent exercise bout, they can perform at high intensity with an, another exercise bout. So this is the feedback from the low carb community when they transition from slamming all those sugary drinks all the time. If they transition away from that to burning fat and ketones for energy, their recovery is rem remarkably more effective. And their blood work shows that too. From They have better uh, health markers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do experience it myself, that as well. And uh, like... Uh, it's it's yeah it's it's generally like uh, easy to uh, be let's say more robust or like yeah you you experience a lot less uh, oxidative stress and your body is very resilient against it. Um, but how would you you mentioned that uh, with with like more keto adaptation you're able to swap uh, back and forth uh, carbs and uh, fats. How would you like um, apply it or how do you train it? How do you condition yourself to achieve that state? Yeah, so that would be metabolic flexibility. And I think the the way to achieve it is to really just do it. Like you could <laughs> you could start out by doing, you know, time restricted eating, you know, start out for sixteen hours of fasting with eight hours of eating, and then do more of a low carbohydrate uh feeding window, and that would further promote uh augmenting fat metabolism and ketone production over time. So uh, you know. I don't think it may not be necessary and probably not optimal to be on a ketogenic diet all the time. And, uh, you know, some, some days I'm a pretty strict ketogenic diet and other days it's more like protein and vegetables and things like that. But I, I definitely think that we're doing our bodies a disservice by not entering ketosis, you know, every now and then, like, uh, at least do it a couple times a month probably mm -hmm. would be optimal, like once or twice a month, uh, at the minimum. And I think in doing so, there is, we talk about muscle memory when we build up to uh, a certain level of bench press and we take, you know, some time off, uh, we get back to that level very quickly, much faster than it took to initially get to that level. The metabolism is the same way. There's a metabolic memory associated with the metabolism that when we diet or fast or, and follow a ketogenic diet and we stop that and we go back to it, we quickly adapt uh, back to that diet when we start. Initially, it can be pretty painful, but it's almost like the body knows what to do when it's already done it. And, and I think that the hardest part of transitioning to a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet is the, just the initial pain associated with weaning yourself off glucose feedings. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think once you do it, it's, it's pretty liberating. And I think there are so many benefits to derive from it. It's almost like you're, you know, I don't, I'm not totally convinced that carbohydrates are addicting. And I think they can be to some extent, but I think sugar and fat and in combination and salt is really the problem. Yeah. But I could say from my perspective that I really have far less, you know, cravings for sugar and carbohydrates now. Hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's more like the the way the food is processed and what are the ingredients. Like, I don't know a lot of people yeah. who are addicted to potatoes, but I probably, you know, but but I can imagine that a lot of people are addicted to potato chips or French fries or something <laughs> because they're like processed yeah, in a yeah. different way and combining them with uh, fats and uh, these other, you know, seasoning. Uh, one thing, one final thing I want to cover is all like how does ketosis affect like the metabolic rate and uh, like uh, maybe yeah like how, do, how, how does it speed up your metabolism or does it slow down it so how, what, what, what does it happen well I mean some of the people are proposing that the ketogenic diet, diet is a you know there's a metabolic advantage to it and early thoughts were that you're losing energy in the form of ketones and urine which you are but I think it's negligible 
Uh, but what you're doing, you know, people would not argue that you're definitely burning more fat, but you're also eating more fat, right? Uh, but I think the net amount of calories that you're burning are essentially the same. There might be a slight advantage with a ketogenic diet because you are losing uh, a bit more energy, you know, maybe in the urine through, you're losing beta hydroxybutyrate and, and acetoacetate in the urine. But even in someone in a heavy state of ketosis, it's only maybe 100 calories per day. I mean, it's still 100 calories. Up. But uh, I don't think there's any particular metabolic advantage from a calorie loss or fat loss perspective, uh, independent of calories you know, if you compare it to a low fat diet, I know this goes against what a lot of the people in the community may argue, but I just, I think uh, the benefit of a, of a low carb or ketogenic strategy is that it prevents cravings that would typically result in the ingestion of surplus calories. So by being able to control your cravings uh, and basically having more control over your glycemic variability that can translate to from a behavioral perspective of better uh, food selection, uh, meal size and preventing overeating that would translate to more surplus calories. So I think really that's the benefit of the ketogenic diet for people with type two, two diabetes and also that want to use this strategy as a weight loss tool and ketone supplementation may augment that by further stabilizing glycemic variability, and also giving your brain ketones, keeping your brain happy. And if your ketones are elevated, it's the reduction, it's the perceived hypoglycemia that then triggers cravings for sugar. So you mm. can mitigate or greatly attenuate a lot of these cravings just by ensuring that your ketones are, are elevated. And I think the data is starting to, uh, these, this is something I've been saying for like 10 years, but I think now the data is starting to indicate, you know, not only from a, an energetic standpoint, but even by influencing things like ghrelin and, uh, and other neurotransmitter systems uh, and neurohormones, uh, it's working in that way too. Mm. Yeah, like I agree. It's, uh, a lot of the times uh, people get the cravings because their brain is like in an energy crisis. They're like deprived of energy, whether it be because of like sleep deprivation or uh, eating a bad diet uh, and, you, you know, giving yourself like these ketones or, you know, getting yourself into ketosis is just going to fix that or at least alleviate some of the side effects. Like you're going to provide your brain with enough of the energy that it needs and uh, instead of getting like the sugar cravings. Uh, but what, what's the difference between like ketone esters and ketone salts? Yeah, so a ketone salt is the ketone body, beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, there are some forms of acetoacetate too that are ionically bound to uh, a mineral uh, or an electrolyte that could be sodium, potassium, calcium, or magnesium. And typically, it could also be an alkaline amino acid potentially, but I don't think there's amino acid salts on the market yet. Uh, so when you ingest these things, it liberates the, the cation and then the beta hydroxybutyrate then goes in circulation and can uh, get into tissues and actually activate receptors and signaling pathways. Uh, whereas a ketone ester is typically metabolized more slowly and it's released over time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the potential is for with ketone esters is that you can elevate ketones higher, potentially extend their levels in the blood a little bit longer. Too, and uh, they are more tolerable from a gastrointestinal perspective uh, also. So both ketone salts and ketone esters can be combined with medium chain triglycerides, and that could be another ketogenic agent that could delay gastric emptying and increase the sort of area under the curve, or it could sort of extend that pharmacokinetic curve to like sustain ketosis longer. And I think from my perspective, it's, it, it's helpful to deliver exogenous ketones like salts and esters within, with a ketogenic fat like MCTs because you're stimulating endogenous ketones at the same time you're elevating your ketones through exogenous sources. Because I do think there's a counter-regulatory feedback mechanism that if you consume a high dose of an ester or a ketone salt, it will decrease endogenous production slightly. The dose has to be pretty high. 
But once the dose of exogenous ketones gets above about two millimolar, that causes a release of insulin, which could potentially mm -hmm. decrease your own ketone production. However, if you take that same dose and combine it with medium chain triglycerides and deliver it, you don't, you are actually augmenting endogenous production at the same time because the MCTs go to the liver via hepatic portal circulation and stimulate the beta oxidation of this fat to produce ketones. So you're, you know, I think the benefit is to, to look for products that actually combine beta hydroxybutyrate and, acetyl, and uh, MCTs together mm. or just buy products and combine it yourself in, mm. in a ratio. Yeah. And different ratios have different effects, so people need to experiment. Mm, yeah, that's uh, really fascinating. I find I find um, very useful for instance for instance when I'm like uh, traveling or uh, if I'm uh, about about to experience some kind of uh, stress like sleep deprivation or uh, yeah like uh, jet lag and that sort of thing. So it kind of helps to fix those symptoms uh, really fast and uh, prevent like this uh, you know dips dips in energy. Yeah, fasting has really been a very useful tool when traveling. And a lot of the ketogenic foods on the market, too. Uh, one of my favorite foods is the keto brick, which is like a thousand calorie yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, brick of, of with a, a macronutrient you know, ratio that's very legitimate, even from a clinical ketogenic diet perspective. So we just, I just traveled over the last couple of weeks and, and the keto bricks were very handy <laughs> when traveling. Yeah, yeah. So, and ketone, ketone uh, supplements too are very, very handy when traveling. Yeah. Is there any specific brand you recommend for the sub keto salts? Uh, you know, I don't, we have different licensing partners through our university, you know, and I tend to favor them, but I don't do it in a public way because it's like, uh, gotcha. my university, you know, has it, but the ones that I've tested and validated through testing are on keto nutrition .org. So I have links to the, the ones that I tested. So I have a number of brands there that are not licensing partners and they're like, so anything that's good, that is a high quality supplement that actually do does what it says. I put that, you know, on the keto nutrition uh, website. So keto nutrition.org.org and look under supplements. And I, I have not just ketone supplements, but MCT powders and things like that, that I've tested. Uh, the keto brick has been the newest supplement that I've tested. And I've been using that pretty much every day and monitoring my glucose and ketones and uh, has been sort of my staple travel food. And I'm going to do another continuous glucose monitor experiment where I'm going to do fasting and test, test more supplements because I want to really validate for the community out there that uh, various ketogenic supplements can not elevate blood glucose levels. And I think mm -hmm. that's important for the medical community, but it's also important for just the everyday people who want to be confident that they can consume some of these bars and products that are on the market and yeah. still, you know, stay in this metabolic state. So I think it's important to vet out the, the good companies that are producing good products and give them a platform. Uh, I try to do that. And, uh, and the ones that don't make it, I just, I don't criticize them. I just don't talk about them. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> yeah. so there's a lot of criticizing other companies, you know, uh, but I think, you know, I try a lot of things and about 20 to 30% of the products, you know, kind of get proved, but about 80% of what I test, I end up just shelving or just giving away or throwing away that mm -hmm. they just do not, they're not true ketogenic products. Right. Yeah, like that's the unfortunate uh, problem with uh, with a, like a very popular diet that people start to take advantage of it and uh, try to uh, get, make money off it uh, without like giving the without giving the promised benefits. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, great uh, talking with you. And uh, before I ask my last question, uh, what's uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, I've compiled a lot of information on keto nutrition, all one word dot org. Dot org, so keto nutrition website, uh, sign up for a newsletter. So I put in information there that you might not find on the website that uh, newest products that I'm testing, publications that we publish, you know, information about uh, the different experiments I'm doing on myself, for example, uh, for the week. So I'm always working on content like this morning, I spent two or three hours analyzing data that I'm going to put into the next newsletter. 
So Keto Nutrition Newsletter, there's a blog, and the website has, you know, the products and companies that we support. Mm, that's good, yeah. We'll leave all the links in the show notes. And my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit you wish you adopted sooner? Adopted sooner? You know what? I think um, one thing that I did early in my career is that I worked nonstop, and I never really took creative downtime where I uh, completely disengaged from work and uh, and really did like creative things. So for me now, that's just taking a walk with my wife and the dogs and completely shutting off and just taking about two hours each day. Uh, it's a little more now because my work is not as demanding. So I think people need to have creative downtime every day and to achieve it they need to actually be disciplined and like schedule in because if i don't actually schedule in that i stop work at this time now my wife makes me stop work at a certain time uh, to do things but if, if i don't like budget it in and actually plan for that then it's not going to happen and i just get consumed with my work but i'm so excited uh, about my work it's like play to me but i think it can be like some people have addictions and I think may, maybe my addiction would be work. I just, I'm so excited about what I'm doing. So it's a good thing, yeah. but it can be a bad thing if you take it to extreme. So yeah. yeah, creative downtime, be sure to schedule it in every day and do something where you're creating and not reacting to things. So we're actually, you know, generating uh, creative content or, or doing exercise or something like that and engaging from a relationship perspective too is very important. Mm. in that time yeah totally and uh, yeah, it's uh, if you enjoy your work then uh, it doesn't ever feel like it work <laughs> it feels like uh, play and uh, doing something good yeah so I'm, I'm very grateful and lucky to have that although in a university system I'm stuck with a couple hours every day of just kind of like paperwork kind of things you know red tape kind of stuff but for the majority of my work day I'm doing things that I'm like super excited about and I'm yeah, really happy that I took this path away from drugs to focus on nutrition for like the things that I was studying. So I can't imagine still doing drug research. I would <laughs> so much more happy going back to nutrition. And, you know, amazingly, this worked better than anything I ever worked on. And it works mm. for so many different, so many different things too, you know. Yeah. So nutrition is a very, very powerful lever. Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, I'm also looking forward to your future work. And uh, yeah excited to see uh, what the what the future for ketosis uh, holds so yeah thanks for coming thank to the podcast you. and uh, yeah let's stay in touch i'll see you around thank you for having me all right that's it for this episode of the body mind Empowerment podcast if you want to support us then i would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on itunes and the other social media platforms you can now order my new book metabolic autophagy that covers a lot of the same topics that we talked in here it's a collection of certain lifestyle habits and practices that prioritize longevity as well as performance. To support this podcast, you can also become a Patreon and get exclusive video lectures from my biohacking bootcamp that covers circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, autophagy, resistance training, biofeedback, and many more. But other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.